today's leading inventors. Join us as Book TV's In Depth welcomes Ray Kurzweil, author of the best selling book, The Age of Spiritual Machines. His latest is The Singularity is Near When Humans Transcend Biology. Tell the folks your name and the size of the curtain that's moving in. Oh, I'm sorry. Your name, please. My name is Raymond Kurzweil, and I'm from Queens, New York. Queens, New York. Well, panel, Raymond and I just happened to have uh, brought along this little piano here, as you see. And Raymond, in addition, also happens to have, uh, as the old saying goes, happens to have a piece of music with him. Uh, and before we show the audience what his uh, secret is, uh, we have just a few seconds for Raymond to play this piece of music. Raymond, the piano's all yours. Thank you. played and now uh, your performance of course leads into your secret so if you'll whisper it to me we'll let everybody at home know what's up. Uh, well that's, that certainly deserves applause but uh, oh the subway's leaving. I'm sorry. That deserves applause but what has it got to do uh, with uh, the music? I don't Good understand class. that. Ah I see. Raymond's secret concerns something that he did, and uh, we'll start the game this time with Bess Myers. Raymond, that's a very unlikely sounding piece of music. <laughs> Am I being super critical? No. Did you compose it? No, I didn't. Oh. Um, did you, however, use, were there some kind of formulas or letters or something unusual used to compose, to make up the notes of this piece? Uh, you, you could say that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, for example, would the notes spell out a name, or would they be a mathematical um, formula, or anything like that? Not spell out a name, nothing like that, no. But there are very... $20 down, 60 to go. Henry? Was that thing written by a computer? Ah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Is it writing music at this moment? Uh, right now, it's writing a tune. Writing a tune? I have a feeling that uh, as a non-scientist, I'm not going to understand this uh, too well, but uh, perhaps you can explain how it works. First of all, I want the folks to see sort of some of this. This nest of spaghetti-like wire here is united to a bunch of little watts. What are these uh, black things over here, Raymond? Well, those are relays. That's yeah. what does the trick. That's what writes the music. I see. The relays write the music. They feed it into this uh, white cheese box here, whatever that is, and there are three little are these wires or just pieces of string? Uh, pieces of string or wires. I mean, does a message go through there or do they just pull I know, that's just uh, recording what the music, what the computer says. I see. And then the uh, typewriter does the final part of the process. Ray Kurzweil, what were you thinking as you were watching that? I haven't seen that for a while. Uh, I looked pretty relaxed there at, at age 17. So. <laughs> what made you want to create a computer that could write music? That was actually my first pattern recognition project. I mean, that's been my field of interest. I've been fascinated with how the human brain is able to recognize patterns. And we actually realize now that that is the heart of human intelligence. I mean, that is, that is what humans are good at. That's what, where we still excel in comparison to machines, and that we can recognize patterns, only certain type of patterns. But machines are getting better. And I've been studying that field and trying to teach computers to recognize patterns. and and that, I think, is really the heart of human intelligence. When we figure that out, we'll be able to create machines that have the full range of human intelligence. And why is it important to have machines do that? Because it's an expansion of our own intelligence. I mean, we already expand our own intelligence with our machines. I mean, we routinely do in intellectual feats that would be impossible without our computers, whether it's math or science. In fact, few professionals could do their jobs today without our machines. Uh, we have an exponentially expanding knowledge base. We're the only species that has knowledge, and that doubles in size every year. And we need our technology to keep track of it. And we need pattern recognition to actually find the information that we want to find. And 
So this is really part of the manifest destiny, if you will, of, of our civilization, to expand knowledge. And pattern recognition is really the key to both creating knowledge and finding it and, and applying it. And could you boil that down to a practical application if a, if a computer does and is able to do that? What could computers do with that kind of information and knowledge? Well, one thing that I've found exciting, uh, I mean, it, what's exciting for an inventor is, is not just an abstract theory, but that sort of leap from formulas on a blackboard to actually changing people's lives. And for people that have sensory disabilities, for example, blindness, and I've worked in that field for 30 years, we can use pattern recognition to overcome those problems. Uh, so actually, the first major project I worked on was a print-to-speech reading machine for the blind. Worked with the National Federation of the Blind on that, the nation's leading organization of blind people, and created a machine that could read printed books out loud to people by recognizing the print uh, in any type style. Character recognition at that time was not really intelligent. It would just match pixel for pixel. It was called temp template matching. And so print had to be in one type style, and it had to be perfectly printed. So it couldn't read thing, ordinary books and magazines and newspapers. So uh, my team and I created the first omni font, any type font, character recognition, and we created a print-to-speech reading machine for the blind. And I've stayed involved with that field for 30 years. We just introduced a pocket-sized reading machine, the Kurzweil National Federation of the Blind Readers. So a blind person can stick it out of their pocket and read print as they go through the day. Uh, sign on a wall, back of a cereal box, ATM display, menu in a restaurant hand out at a meeting, and uh, really overcomes a, the principal handicap associated with visual impairment. What are today's computers able to do as far as your ideas for how they can accommodate that technology, and what do the future of computers hold as far as what they'll be able to do? Well, a lot of people ask whatever happened to artificial intelligence, and it uh, kind of reminds me of people who go in the rainforest and say, where are all the species that are supposed to be here? I mean, there's 50 species of ants within uh, you know, 10 yards of them. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence, machines doing tasks that used to require human intelligence is deeply integrated into our infrastructure. I mean, every time you send an email or connect a cell phone call or you buy a product that was designed with computer designed software that's intelligent, just in time inventory levels are controlled by intelligent algorithms, manufactured in robotic factories, intelligent algorithms fly and land airplanes, guide intelligent weapon systems, make billions of dollars of financial decisions, and I could give you a long list. So we are, I mean, our whole economic infrastructure is amplified. We are far more productive, and in fact, far wealthier because of, of this type of intelligent technology. And these were actually research projects 15 years ago. And the thrust of my books is that we will actually achieve the full range of human intelligence, both because computers are growing exponentially in capability, they're doubling every year for the same price that's multiplying by a billion in 30 years. It's actually 25 years to be exact. And if you imagine how influential they are already, imagine multiplying their capability by a billion in the next quarter century, you get some idea of what will be feasible. And the software is also improving. One of the sources of that is to actually figure out how the human brain works. And we're making exponential progress in that. The spatial resolution of brain scanning is doubling every year. The amount of data we're collecting on the brain is doubling every year. The latest generation of brain scanners can actually see now for the first time individual interneural connections. We can see our brain create our thoughts. We can actually see our thoughts create our brain because we actually create new brain matter as we think about things. And we're also showing that we can turn this information into working models and simulations of brain regions. There's already 20 regions of the brain out of several hundred that exist that we have actually modeled and simulated in computers, and then we can apply sophisticated tests to the simulation, get similar results as applying those same tests to, to human capability. It includes the cerebellum, where we do our skill formation. It's an important region comprising more than half the neurons in the brain. And I make the case in my latest book, uh, Singularity is Near, in fact, Chapter 4 is devoted to this, that we, within 20 years, we will actually have models and simulations of all several hundred regions of the brain, including the cerebral cortex, where we do our abstract reasoning, and there's already a simulation of that being developed by IBM. Uh, and we will have then the tool, uh, the, well, we'll have the secrets of human intelligence. We'll have more insight into ourselves. And the toolkit that we use in artificial intelligence to create intelligent machines will be greatly expanded to incorporate 
the methods that our own brains use. And then, and then machines will operate at human levels, but it won't be an alien invasion of intelligent machines to compete with us. I mean, it really is amplifying our own civilization. And we're going to literally enhance our own intellectual capabilities by ultimately merging with this technology. And that's what you mean by the term singularity? Well, this leads up to the singularity. Uh, I mean, we can talk more about how we get there, but a, a really key threshold is achieving human levels of intelligence, the full range, particularly our, our powers of pattern recognition, which, as I said, is the core of human intelligence, uh, in a machine. And, I, and I've been consistent for decades now that 2029 we will achieve that threshold. Uh, but that won't automatically profoundly transform human civilization. We, we already have human intelligence. We've got billions of people walking around with human intelligence. But th the biological intelligence of our civilization is fixed. We have uh, 10 to the 26 power calculations per second in all the 6, 7 billion humans uh, on this planet. That's not going to grow. 50 years from now, it will still be 10 to the 26 power. Non-biological intelligence is multiplying by 1,000 every decade, and even that speed is speeding up. So non-biological intelligence will ultimately exceed biological intelligence. We will merge with this technology, and we can, I can describe how that will happen. But if you go out to the 2040s, the non-biological portion of the intelligence of our civilization will be about a billion times greater than the biological portion. Now, that's a profound transformation. And we use the metaphor borrowed from physics of a singularity, really referring to the event horizon. In physics, there's an event horizon around a singularity, around a black hole. It's very hard to see past it because the gravity inside the event horizon keeps all the information in. There's some quantum ways that you can get the information out, but basically it's hard to see past the event horizon. But we can use our intellect to talk about what life would be like past the event horizon. So borrowing that metaphor to human history, there will be this profound transformation where we're going to amplify our own intelligence a billion fold by the middle of this century. And it's hard to see past that event horizon because it's so transformative. On the other hand, we can use our intellect, such as it is, to talk about what life will be like uh, 20, in 2045, 2050. And that's what I try to do in my book. It basically refers to a profound transformation as we multiply our own intelligence through this exponentially growing you know, non-biological intelligence that we're creating. Why not leave human intelligence as it is and let it progress as it, as it should on its own? Well, there's a few reasons. I mean, I'll mention two. I mean, one is we have a lot of suffering in the world that we want to overcome. And technology is already greatly amplified our ability to solve problems. Human life expectancy was 25 post-infant mortality 1,000 years ago. It was 37 in 1800. I mean, Schubert and Mozart died in the 30s. It was pretty tragic, but that was typical. There was no sanitation, no antibiotics. Uh, life was short, brutish, disaster-prone, disease-filled, poverty-filled. I mean, Thomas Hobbes described it quite well. And we've come a long way because of technology. Uh, and we're now going to be reprogramming the information processes underlying biology. Biology basically is a set of information processes, but we didn't have the genome until three years ago. But we're now actually gaining the means to reprogram our biology. We can turn genes off with RNA interference. The discoverers of that just got the Nobel Prize a couple of weeks ago. We can add new genes with gene therapy. We can turn on and off enzymes. We can reprogram biology. And we can go beyond biology by merging it with nanotechnology. That's something that will be feasible in 20 years. But if you look at where we've come, uh, this is not a new story. We are the species that goes beyond our limitation. We didn't stay in the ground, we didn't stay in the planet, and we haven't stayed with the limitations of our biology. Uh, human life was very, very hard. I mean, it was extremely high levels of struggle just 100 years ago. Human life expectancy was 45 in 1900. Uh, when Social Security was put in place in the 30s, uh, 65 was considered quite old. I mean, I'm pushing 60, and I don't consider, I mean, I can collect Social Security in a few years. I don't really. Uh, I mean, I feel that the nature of aging has changed. And this, but there's still a lot of suffering. I mean, you don't have to look far to find people who, let's say, got a diagnosis of cancer or have to, are struggling with some other disease or 
profound problem of one kind or another, poverty. Uh, we're making progress because of technology. The World Bank reported that poverty in Asia has been cut by half over the last decade because of information technology, but we, we still have a long way to go. And only technology really has the scale to really solve the problems that, that we're facing. And we can talk later.